Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure CES. Well, happy to be back with everybody. Don't let them do that uh, anymore. Get second. A... I am feeling really well right now. Well, I do have one thing. I won't go into that, but at least I'm feeling well enough. I'm happy to be here. Uh, we will probably finish up our study of. Um, Philippians tonight, then next week begin with Colossians. So uh, get your Bibles ready and go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, let's start off first by saying hello to the congregation. Uh, Brother Ben, you want to say hello to everybody? Okay. And yeah, I do too. I was going to say, are you speaking from a canyon? <laughs> yeah, why is that? But okay, Renee, while you're while you're chatting there, uh, why don't you say hello to everybody? Hey there, beloved saints. Good to be with you. Glad to hear that uh, Brother Luke is feeling better. Oh, he's so grumpy when he's sick. I'm just so glad he's not grumpy. <laughs> We're happy to have you back, Brother Luke, and happy to see you, Ben. Uh, I'm looking forward to the study tonight, and uh, I'm interested uh, uh, in hearing everybody's positions on this because every time we get together I, I see something I've never seen before so I'm excited about that and chat we're interested in your ideas on the scriptures tonight too okay thank you uh, all right, before we get started, uh, take a look in the chat room, everybody, and you'll see that we've got a YouTuber by the name of Revivalists for Christ. That's uh, Brother Jordan Tyler, and um, he'll be a moderator in the chat room, and uh, we could use his help. So uh, everybody say hi to Brother Jordan. Uh, he's also going to be helping us uh, with uh, the the programs that we have, these live programs, Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday, he'll be working with Brother Ben, helping to produce some of these programs. So uh, we're real happy that uh, he's able and uh, eager to uh, be big help to CES. So uh, thank you, Brother Jordan, and uh, welcome. Um, all right, anything you guys want to say before we get into verse 7? All right, then, let's, re let's do it. Uh, um, Brother Ben, why don't you read verse 7 and, and let Renee uh, uh, teach on. All right, verse 7. Uh, let me flip to the uh, scripture here. Okay. One moment. Okay, verse 7 in the KJV. And the peace of God, which, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, from what I remember last week, uh, there was some discussion about these two uh, fellow laborers, these two women that were working with Paul in the gospel um, had had a falling out of some sort. There was some kind of argument or something. And uh, he says he asked the church as a whole and some people specifically to help them come to like mind and uh, and everything come together and says rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice let your moderation be known to all men the Lord is at hand be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God now this is when it says and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus so um, we often hear this the peace that passeth all understanding when when Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, Paul, in the correct context, was that he could be in prison and still have peace and joy. He could be hungry and in want and need and still have peace. He could be sick and still have peace. He could be shipwrecked and have peace. He could know his impending death and still have peace. That's the peace that passes understanding. And it's what he meant by I can do all things. Now, the 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 uh, 
health, wealth, prosperity people tell you, you can achieve all your worldly goals. That was not what it meant at all. It meant regardless of what you're facing, whether you have a lot or a little, whether you're in jail or you're free, no matter what, you can be at peace. You can still have an inner joy because of the hope set before us. And when the Holy Spirit dwells within us, Christ himself, the spirit of Christ in us. And so he's telling us here that the peace of God, which passes understanding, because people from the outside might be like, you're the most persecuted people in the world. They're killing you every day. Many of you are poor and homeless and they don't understand it, right? It passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So regardless, because he just mentions, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made up known unto God. Give it all to God. He will take care of it. And until then, he's got your back and you will have peace. So I, I think that's a, a strong statement. The peace that passes all understanding. Okay, thank you. All right, Brother Ben, what do you say about it? Uh, well, yeah, like Renee said, it's good to kind of back it up uh, a previous verse where it says, because the, the peace and understanding, the, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, I believe is conditioned. It's not something that you're going to have all the time, which uh, I know some people teach that. They said, oh, if you don't have the peace of God, you must not be saved. If, you have, if you're anx anxious, you must not be saved. So they use and abuse this verse. And yet I think all this verse is teaching is that if, if, we we are in prayer with thanksgiving, thanking you know, think, thanking God for all that He's done for us, remembering what He has done for us and what He promises to do for us, uh, and with supplication. And supplication um, is really just means the, the word supplication basically means to it, it's the action of asking for something earnestly or humbly. So as we humbly uh, ask and cast all our cares on God, as First Peter five seven says. First Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. That's what God wants us to do. He want, He loves it when we depend on him, and we don't rely on our own strength. Um, and so I, I believe that what uh, if we want that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, again, I don't believe it's a necessarily a feeling per se. It's an understanding that God's got this... <laughs> God's got this. He's got. He's got all your. He has your best interest in need always, even in, even things that you may think are uh, detrimental to you. Um, they're ultimately for your good. And so, as we uh, get anxious about things, if we remember and are thankful to God for all that He has done and is doing and will do, and uh, and also that we're you know humbly asking Him for more, uh, asking for to meet, to meet our needs. Um, we can we can count on God uh, to to do what's right. He's not he's has our guest. He's he's our protector. He's our guardian. So he guards our hearts and our minds through Christ. And um, I think a big part of that too is is abiding in the Word as well, sound doctrine. So that's all I have for that verse. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, thank you. Well, <clears throat> this is a very comforting verse. Um, I, I could just read the verse uh, over and over as, as a prayer and and as uh, as a uh, meditate on it. It's very comforting. So uh, I, I often like to say that I think this is in Proverbs. It says, uh, uh, "Peace like a river, and joy like a fountain." Uh, th this should be our state. Uh, now, our, our standing before God, I, I, there's one of my favorite videos of all time on YouTube, was made by, um, uh, let me see, uh, Streets Preacher 1611 is the name of the channel. He made a video, and it's with the animated characters, uh, it, 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 the way he did it, but it, it's titled Standing in State. And it's really good to show that our standing before God as saved uh, is secure and nothing can change that but the state uh, that we're in any given time changes uh, 
but uh, we really should, I think, be able to have this peace and joy all the time, especially if we can reflect on these verses seven and when we come to verse eight, that's one of my all time favorite verses. Uh, I'm going to read verse seven in uh, the Amplified and see how they uh, express it. It says, and the peace of God, that peace which reassures the heart, that that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus is yours. That's very, very reassuring. So uh, I, I would say that, you know, make a note of this verse and save it and have it handy to, to go to. Uh, it can probably rescue you uh, and give you the perspective that you really need. I mean, after all, we, we are already uh, in, in Christ Jesus. We're already seated in the heavenly places. Uh, and and uh, our, our uh, promise of eternal life on uh, the, the new heaven and uh, the new earth, uh, paradise. I mean, you talk about joy and peace. Uh, it's, it's even beyond that. I, 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 I like to say it's, it's ecstasy. Imagine, imagine existing through all eternity with such a state of joy that you're in ecstasy. And that's your constant state for all eternity. This is what I believe is uh, waiting for us. And, and so we, all we need to do is remind ourselves of this. And that will probably uh, snap us out of... Uh, um, you know, give, counting our blessings and, and getting the right perspective. Uh, now, when it says, uh, oh, I'm going to read it in the um, Young's Literal. It says, and the peace of God that is surpassing all understanding shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Uh, I guess no matter how they translate it, it just sounds beautiful to me. Uh, but surpasses all understanding. It makes me think of the book, in, I mean, the verse in Revelation where it says, uh, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, or no mind can even imagine the good things God has prepared for those who love him. Uh, so we can't even imagine, we can't conceive. Uh, it, it surpasses our understanding. So uh, that we, we, we can't even be, begin to even understand this peace that God ha has for us. It, should re it will reassure our hearts. Um, and when it says it stands guard over your hearts, let me read it in the KJV, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, or in the Amplified it says, shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. So... Um, if that's, if that's not happening for you, if, if you're not having this kind of an attitude, that's not your, uh, your kind of your default, then uh, I think you just need to keep on praying this verse. Uh, all right, uh, Renee. We're going, yeah, you know, I want to uh, make a point. Ben made a really great point here. Um, fruits of the spirit are not automatic unless you're doing what, God says to do spending time in the word, spending time in prayer with the attitude of gratitude, like this verse tells us Thanksgiving, supplication, etc. And I agree, Ben uh, and Luke, that our state is not our standing. Our state can change and we can get anxious for things. Uh, but we're told not to. We're told to cast our cares on Christ. And if we do that, then we will have this peace. It is accessible and available to us if we're thinking correctly, if we're thinking on things that are spiritual and not just earthly. Uh, for instance, I think of Joseph when he was cast into prison after being sold by his brothers. Oh, my goodness. He must have felt at first like God forsook him, but never, never do we see that happen. He stayed faithful to God because he knew God had not forsaken him. Uh, and that would look like a peace that passes all understanding to others. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense to them how, how people can just be at peace during the most horrific times. 
and uh, especially under the persecution these people were facing. And it, it could also be a reference to the two ladies above that were having division and there was some discord going on in that church. And it looks like Paul is trying to get them to focus on the spiritual things and their unity rather and healing rather than division here as well. And yeah, Ben, that's a good point. People can you, you know, they can use these things. If you don't have this or if you're not doing this, you're not really saved. And that is one of them. That's absolutely true. Yeah, we we have some recent history with that actually happening here at CES. Uh, uh, someone was actually declaring uh, other people unsaved because of uh, their uh, maybe their their mood or their mannerisms or or their you know these these things that are totally irrelevant as far as testing someone's salvation. So yeah, let's. let's What's that? Elijah was suicidal. He was suicidal. Was Elijah not God's people? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. You know, it's trouble. Okay. Uh, all right. Renee, uh, verse 8. Would you read that and ask Ben to uh, teach on it? Yes, sir. Let me read it here. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, what's over? I love this verse, you guys. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Yes, I think this kind of goes in line with the previous verse. Um... You know, if you have anxiety, one thing I'll say from experience, if you do have anxiety and fear and you're becoming anxious um, about various things, it could be what you're feeding yourself. And I don't mean physically, but I mean spiritually, what you're, what you're, what you're feasting your eyes on. Um, you know, so there's a lot of darkness in the world. And I know a lot of believers who feel like somehow they're obligated or it's their duty uh, or they somehow, they, somehow it's, it's a good thing to peer into the darkness. And, uh, and, and that's, it, that's, you know, that's not good for us. You know, there, there's a lot of channels that have a Christian bent. I can name half a dozen right now that are constantly posting videos about, oh, did you see the Illuminati in this Super Bowl thing? Or did you see this or that? The Freemasons, what they're doing and all the darkness things that dark things are doing. And that's, and they're constantly watching those videos and and that's what they, that's what their mind is filled with. Um, they may, may, again, I'm not saying they, they accept those things, they reject it, but it's causing an anxiety and it, that darkness can, you can internalize it. And, um, and I'm, I'm speaking from experience. I'm, spe I'm preaching to myself here <laughs> as well. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's at all what scripture commends us to do. We know there's evil out there. And so we, we are put, you know, supposed to fix our eyes on the good things and, and set our mind on the good things. And. That's exactly what Paul has done here. He has all these uh, verses uh, or all these different things of, you know, what things that are just, that, that those are righteous things, uh, whatever, whatever, are, whatever things are pure. Usually in the Bible, when it speaks of purity, uh, in the New Testament at least, it, it, it has to do with grace. Uh, like the, the river uh, flowing from the uh, throne of God is, you know, pure, very pure and clear as crystal. Um it's it's sincerity, not not hypocritical. So purity is it has to do with grace, being unhypocritical. You know, it's born out of love. Things are lovely. Things that are good report. I think God's filled creation with very lovely things. Um, his creation is is a very lovely thing. And so, uh, again, I, I think th these are all things we can we can you know set our mind on, not not focusing on the darkness, but focusing on the things that that are good in the world, because there is a lot of good in this world. Um, yes, there's a lot of evil too, and the forces that the powers that be definitely like to uh, emphasize the negative. Um, you know, that's what all the news is about. You know, it's always about uh, uh, what's it called? What's the saying? If it bleeds, it reads, or what? If it, I, I don't remember what it is, but uh, there's if there's it, saying. If it bleeds, it leads. It's the lead you. story. Thank you. Yes, that that's perfect. Um, 
and that's what you know again the, the world tries to tries to penetrate our our peace um with these i think a lot a lot of times exaggerated or false realities and um you know we, we don't need to fall for it we should be smarter than that and I think if we do uh, follow this prescription as Paul has laid out here, uh, we will naturally be more at ease. That's all I have. Oh, man, I was so happy when you said that. Uh, God bless the watchmen in the Christian community. I am not coming against them, but there are some channels set up only will traumatize you. Just constant bad news, constant conspiracy and, you know, sometimes when you really dig to the truth of it, it's not the truth. Like a lot of it's just a lot of scare tactic propaganda and you dig and dig and dig. For instance, the the guillotine thing, our government bought 30,000 guillotines. They're setting up to decapitate Christians. Guillotine was the name of large industrial paper and document sh- cutters that the government has in all the bases around the world. They're, they weren't for decapitating people. And if, if you really dig into the truth of these things and look at the documents, most people don't. They just hear it on a conspiracy channel and then start repeating it to others without actually investigating it. And I know many of them mean well, but we need to watch what we're constantly feeding our eyes because we already know that there's an enemy out there. But he is under the feet of Jesus. We have nothing to fear. And whatever is going to happen, God will get us through that. We are his people. And so whenever I see people, and I can't tell you the people that contact me in paralyzed terror over this conspiracy stuff. I mean, just paralyzed. Am I going to, is that the mark of the beast? Am I going to hell? I mean, it's just constant fear and and i'm like oh my goodness nobody would ever want to be a christian if you were the person that was supposed to represent it and and that's not being mean paul tells us what we're to focus on things that are of a good report god is still on the throne and there are many amazing things that god does every day you don't see the beautiful things i was actually going to start a channel um where i gave a good news, good report story every day. I'm just overwhelmed. I haven't been able to do it. Got so much stuff going on. But I I feel like Christians need this because let's look at this verse real quick. I'm going to read this. I I paraphrase this verse constantly, and I'm not telling you to be ignorant of, of Satan's devices, okay? But he is a creature that is defeated and on a short leash. If you're God's people, you have nothing to worry about pray for the lost know that they're in darkness and just pray for them you don't we don't have to you know i heard somebody say a long time ago you keep peeking in the darkness the darkness is going to peek back and i i think it's important that you don't dive so far into darkness that it consumes you and turns it into fear and anxiety these people they they were aware that their friends and families were being martyred but they didn't focus on it all the time. You didn't You didn't hear these letters uh, where they're writing where so-and-so was tortured for seven days and then they did this to him and then they did that to him. And you know, they might do that to you. That wasn't in these letters. Nothing but hope were in these epistles. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, instead of talking about the unjust case, talk about, a just resolve whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report by the way uh you're always hearing about uh promiscuous women why don't you tell the story of the one young couple that were virgins and married each other i can tell you that happened in my church recently pastor's son 18 years old married a, a young girl they got married they were chaste until marriage just like the Bible told them to. They didn't even hold hands until they were married. So I can tell you things that are pure and of a good report, but you don't hear of that often. If there be any virtue and there be any praise, think on these things. And I believe like Ben and Luke were both saying, the peace that passes all understanding, it comes from focusing the mind on these things. And I think this is a a wonderful passage to keep uh, in your heart. 
if you're watching the news all the time and I'm not saying be ignorant and ignore everything. It's just how much detail and stuff, how much conspiracy. De- they're evil. We get it. They're evil. Leave them alone. Pray for them. Think on good stuff so that you can be a light and have peace so that others will want that as well. Yeah. Amen. Uh, well, I, I said earlier that this verse eight uh, is a verse that I've brought up many times. You've probably heard me uh, cite it maybe on a Sunday when it's time to give an, uh, an exhortation. I, I, I can always go to that verse. What, what's more of an exhortation than this verse? Uh, I'll, I'll read it in the Amplified, uh, see what it how it uh, amplifies it. <clears throat> it says, finally, believers. See, um, brethren, this is a, something we went through when we were in the book of Galatians uh, uh, that was uh, important to understand that uh, a lot of times uh, there's various ways that the scriptures uh, call the believers, but here the Amplified, they translate this rather than it says uh, in uh, the KJV it says brethren, but in the Amplified it, it says believers. Uh, a, a, the brethren are the believers. Uh, now there are some cases where uh, you see the word brethren, and it's not talking about those who believe in Jesus. It's talking about the, the, a fellow Jew. So you have to look at the context. But but uh, uh, in, in this case, in many cases, uh, brethren. It means believers. So uh, again, this letter is to believers in uh, Philippi, uh, telling them, no matter what the situation is, you you sh- you can be joyful. You should be joyful. And so, finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word. Whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and good report, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things, uh, center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. Um, I think they did a, 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 a few of the things that they amplified or expounded on the uh, the KJV is uh, was very, very good. Um, the KJV language is more poetic, and uh, that's one of the things I love about the KJV. It's uh, well, I've heard people say that the KJV uh, version is written in perfect iambic pentameter. That's hard for me to really believe that the whole Bible. And the KJV is written in iambic pentameter. That's a that's a form of poetry where a certain number of uh, like beats. It's a rhythm, and uh, I, I don't really believe that's correct. But I've heard it said often by people. Uh, but I think there are a lot of cases where the KJV language is just poetic and be- more beautiful the way it's expressed. So however you read it, though, this verse here uh, is one of my favorites. So maybe, uh, Jordan, maybe this will be the verse, but no, I've got another verse in mind because I'm going to go on Jordan's uh, program uh, pretty soon. He has a live programs, and uh, he always asks his guests, uh, what's your favorite Bible verse? So I've got one ready for him, but I'm tempted to use this, but um, I've got another one in mind. Uh, But... uh, uh, so whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, and, you know, uh, what, Renee, when you read it the first time to Ben, I noticed, and I was curious as you're reading it, how you're going to uh, read this. But when you got to the final words, you said, think on these things. You emphasize the word these. Yes. And, yeah. And, and I, I know you did it for the right reason that, that hey that what we're really supposed to be getting in, uh, out of this verse is uh, not just think on these things but think on these things rather than the other things right and, and, and so 
it was not an insult, by the way. Some people are concerned I'm I'm saying they're not a good Christian or I, I'm not at all. It's just an exhortation for all of us. If we want to have our joy and our peace, these this should be what we focus on more. That's all. Not an insult to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So think on these things rather than the things that we normally think about. We, it, it's, it is natural, especially we, we got the flesh. And uh, Paul says, uh, you know, I, I want to do the right thing, but I do the wrong thing. And uh, I want to, don't want to do the wrong thing, and, and yet I do it. And, and that, that portion of scriptures is very important because most people consider Paul not only an apostle, but one of the greatest apostles, apostles, one of the greatest Christians, a true example for all of us. And he said earlier, I think it was in this very book here, uh, we just covered it recently, that uh, uh, he, he said that he is an example to follow. How, how is it f phrased again? Do you, do you remember? Um, uh, follow me. Uh, but uh, uh, so, uh, Oh, I forgot where I was going, but uh... yes, Paul. Paul did say, "Follow my example." Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, it, it's phrased better than that, but uh, I, I forgot uh, how to spread crazy. But Paul is an example for us to follow, and and he, and but he's not only an example in that he's saying, "Look, you you should be positive. You should have joy, regardless if you're shipwrecked, snake bitten." Uh, beaten, le stoned, left for dead, no matter what, you should be joyful. You can be joyful. Uh, uh, so he set a lot of examples for us, uh, but he also set the example of saying, look, even he, such a great Christian, he struggled and, and uh, he, he couldn't always do the right thing because the flesh is there. So as long as the flesh is there, our default is not verse eight. Our default is negative, complaining, you know, being being uh, bitter and negative, and focusing on the wrong things and negativity. And uh, this is really, uh, if we're going to put it in kind of a, a secular language for people to understand, this is being a positive thinker. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly not teaching, uh, you know, a name it and claim it kind of thing. We won't go that far, but we will say, uh, I think we all agree, that uh, if you have this kind of an attitude all the time, uh, your life will be better. It will become a reality that you will have the joy if you think on these things. Um, all right, uh, Ben and Renee, you want to say any more about verse 8? Well, with regard to what you just said about uh, if you know, if you think on these things, your life will be more positive. The difference between the secular world and us is that our our positivity is based on truth, you know, a real reality. Where they may may think positively on vain things, uh, we you know ours are based on a solid foundation. So there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think one of you talked about uh, uh, getting like sidetracked with the news. And I, I think the same thing is also true on scriptures, too. I, I mean, not scripture, but theology. Uh, there, there are certain subjects in theology that uh, are kind of like rabbit holes that, that can really uh, grab us, take us off track and divert us from, uh, um, let's say, fellowship. And, and evangelism and that, that's really what we should be primarily focused on fellowship with each other fellowship with jesus and evangelism uh, but when we start getting involved in like conspiracy theories and the new world order and the masons and all that stuff it's intriguing and we probably all fall into that at some point in our christian studies we get diverted but when you're thinking on those things uh, it's a very negative thing to be thinking about all the conspiracies in the world all the time and, and all the, you know, the, the evil that's, uh, that we have and the evil that's coming. And, uh, you know, uh, Renee, I told you that, uh, by the way, everybody, I, I keep on bringing up the idea that I've, uh, um, I think I've really got my uh, playlist on eschatology perfect now. 
So go to my channel, Brother Luke, and find the playlist Eschatology. And yeah, I've, I've listened to quite a bit of it. It's uh, I was looking at the new stuff you put up earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one of the reasons that I replaced Steve Gregg's uh, teaching through Revelation uh, with, uh, rather than um, Bruce Gore, uh, they uh, they both uh, uh, are um, uh, pre 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 millennial and partial preterist viewpoint that they're they're uh, that's their uh, conclusion, but they uh, the difference is Bruce Gore is uh, what's called a um, a post millennial. Uh, um, posit, um, well, what, what, how do they phrase it? Um, it's a posit, um, no, um, optimist. In other words, they believe that the world is going to become more and more Christian until it, the whole world has become so Christian that Jesus will return. In other words, they think the world's going to get better and better and better. They have an optimistic outlook. Right, right. I, I heard some of that. Yeah. They, yeah. They, instead, I, I still think it's going to wax worse and worse until he comes. Yeah, I think the Bible teaches the very opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, you know, it's not like they don't have good arguments for the, their, their position. They can use scripture to support it. But I, I, I'm, I'm not on that side. I, mm -hmm. I, I believe, I believe the world's getting worse and it's going to get worse until, until it finally uh, is, is so bad that uh, the Lord returns then. So some people are optimists. Some people are pessimists about how history is going to play out before the Lord returns. Uh, but uh, the uh, those of us who have the negative outlook, uh, well, we have to be careful. Even though we know that it's it's a lot of there's just sin and so much evil in the world, it disgusts me. And I know it's I believe it's going to get worse and worse. And yet, if I let that uh, take over. I, I, I'm going to get depressed, and, and it just just can't. You know, like someone just wrote in the chat room, they can't wait to leave. You've heard me say it. I can't wait to leave and, and get out of this place. But let's not let that well, take away our joy. Jesus compared it to the days of Noah. Back then, people just lived with it. They didn't. They they. It didn't bother them that it was evil. The only people that bothered were people of God. Everybody else thought it was some free for all utopia without God. So the whole world thinks it's going to be great. It's going to get better and better. But Christians are going to be grieved by it, you know, uh, because it, it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And we know that there was no such time since uh, Noah before it was that bad. Sodom and Gomorrah was an example of how bad it got uh, after Noah. They it, God destroyed that city. So I think yeah, it's it's going to be like the days of Noah, but it's not going to bother anybody but us. And in order for us to be some kind of light to the world, we can't allow the darkness to overtake us. We have to shine out. We have to show people there's light so that they can see there is darkness. It's not utopia. It's horrible, you know, and only uh, through uh, God can give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. To realize that what they live in is utter darkness. So we have to make sure that darkness doesn't overcome us so that we can continue to be a light. As Jesus said, what good is salt if it's lost as saltiness? Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, as the world uh, and changes, uh, you're right. The world as a whole thinks these changes are positive. Uh, but, uh, you know, we see it differently. Uh, like, uh, oh, it's, isn't it wonderful that, uh, that, that anybody can get married now? But no, we say no. There, there's, uh, the, some marriages are unnatural. We, it's, not, it's not a beautiful thing. Uh, and just as things that the world thinks are improvements, we think, no, it's, that's, it's not an improvement. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's getting worse. Um, okay, any more before we go to the next verse? All right, so uh, Ben wanted to read verse uh, 9 for Renee. Okay, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. All right, sorry, I couldn't get to my little 
thingy there. So he's continuing on his thought. Let me, I'm trying to find the right screen, you guys. Hold on. Okay. So he's continuing on the thought, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. So uh, he's continuing his thoughts earlier. He mentions in the earlier chapter, be followers of me. And he tells them to have the mindset he has. You know, that he's uh, going after the prize of the high calling of God and to walk in the power of his resurrection now in his life. And although he's not perfect yet in this flesh, he hasn't attained the resurrection, obviously he's still alive, that he's going to strive. And so when he says, this is what you need to think of, these are the things you focus on, and these are the, this is the way you walk, right? So he says, the things which you both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. So he's referring to all the instruction as well as keeping him and other uh, mature believers in their sight because they're followers of Jesus. And so they have a actual concrete uh, person that they can follow that's following Christ in the footsteps of Jesus. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ben? Um, yes. So sound doctrine is important. Uh, that's orthodoxy. And so sound behavior co or conduct is also uh, very important. That's orthopraxy, um, putting it into practice. What you, what the ortho, the uh, the doctrine, and so that reminds me of you know James one twenty two that says, uh, uh, "Be not uh, hearers of the word only, but doers; uh, otherwise you deceive yourself." And it, it's for our own good, you know. Again, it, as so, I I remember you guys had, you had an interesting discussion. I think it was last week or the week before that about uh, uh, talking about you know. Uh, the people who were, um, whose God was their belly and you're kind of debating back and forth whether or not, whether or not that was a believer or not. And I think, uh, yeah, there were good comments there, but, uh, I think essentially it, it, it doesn't really matter. It, it, it says that it says, so the, those who, who Paul was exhorting to them in chosen chapter three, where he's exhorting them to say, um, follow my example, but in other words, and don't follow these people example, whose God is their belly, they're, they're self-serving and their end is destruction. And again, you could take, I think it's kind of intentionally vague uh, because it could be referring to a believer or unbeliever. So obviously the word destruction there, by the way, too, it just really means, ultimately means ruin or loss. And uh, that's a, that's a, that's a play on, kind of play on words or a play on a theme, at least in, in, um, Philippians, where you see the losing and gaining, uh, gaining and losing, and so um, the the scope of that loss, uh, you know, for those who uh, who serve themselves, it will obviously, if they're a believer, uh, their end is not destruction and hell. Their but their their end is their their earthly whatever they're pursuing, their 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 shame, their their pursuing shameful things. That's their glory. Uh, well, it's ultimately going to lead uh, to their ruin. If they're a believer, it just means loss of rewards and a ruined life in this in this life. Uh, it is not loss of salvation. At the same time, if it's an unbeliever, then it obviously does refer to um, eternal loss. Um, and I I think that's what he said. He's saying here as well. Again, the things that which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. So he's saying, you know, you you heard that you received the sound doctrine. It saved you. It will it saved you eternally, and it'll also save you temporally, um, and also in terms of salvation, it'll save you in terms of uh, abundant rewards. And so, Paul is set forth as an example that they should have should follow, um, even though we haven't seen Paul in his actions. We learn we learn of him, and we see his heart through his scripture. It's pretty clear, uh, and he obviously had the heart of God. And so, uh, you know, he was following, he, his example was Jesus. So Jesus and Paul are both excellent examples that we should follow. And by that good conduct, we, you know, we're saved from uh, a disaster in this life, a ruined life, a calamity. Um, and that's why if we do those things, the God of, the God of peace will be with you. Um, and again, when it says the God of peace will be with you, I believe he's really just referring to it like in, in, in a abiding closeness sense, an intimate sense. 
he, he, the closer you are to God, if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. It's, it's that kind of idea where, um, obviously, the, the closer you are to God, the more peaceful and ease you are going to be. And um, that's what God wants for you. And that's, I think, that's what we all should desire for ourselves and for our fellow believer. And so uh, it's very important, again, that, that ortho, uh, doctrine is, is good. And that's, you know, that's that, that's the, probably the most important. But we also should uh, walk the talk. Um, so I think that's what essentially what he's saying. Hmm. Or orthopraxy, you called it? Yes. Orthopraxy, that's good. Orthodoxy is doctrine. Orthopraxy pra is like practice. Okay. So orthodoxy means the, uh, the, the doctrine that is in normal in the church that is, is the the standard and then so practice the, the way you practice or live that's that's the what's normal or expected in the church right is that correct that's the way i understand it yeah. okay um well i um i said i thought that uh, this uh, I I statement, what i knew i'd learn something <laughs> Uh, I thought that this statement about following Paul, we had just talked about it recently. So I just went back a chapter and it, it says in the, where it's right near the uh, belly uh, verse, you know, uh, oh, let me see. It's in, in uh, chapter three, verse uh, 17. It says, um, brethren, be followers together of me. Uh I think there's another place earlier where he says, be followers of me as I am follower of Christ. Uh, but that's the uh, that's the same kind of point, I think, that's made here in uh, verse 9. He says, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. So Paul is saying, follow his example. Uh, and the God of peace shall be with you. Um, so, well, the God, God of peace is with us, uh, you know, regardless, because that's unavoidable. I mean, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. There's no way God cannot be with us all the time. But it's also good to, to know that when we are doing these right things, uh, the following the example Paul set, set here, uh, then uh, God is with us not only in in sealed in their spirit, but God is with us and he's, he's really on our side and supportive of what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to read nine in the Amplified and see how they phrase it. It says, the thing which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things in daily life and the God who is the source of peace and well-being will be with you. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I I haven't seen any real uh, footnotes. Oh, in verse eight, there's a footnote here. It says the language employs terms from Roman Stoic thought. You know, Paul was very learned. Uh, probably, there. Uh, I don't know of any apostle, particularly of the the original, the twelve apostles. Now, maybe Apollos, or maybe um, let me see. Um, hmm. Which, which of the apostles that, you know, the Bible refers to other people as apostles rather than just the, the, the 12. But uh, uh, I, Paul was more learned. Uh, the others were fishermen. They probably had a, an average education, but they weren't scholars. But Paul was really a scholar. So he could relate to the scholars in, in, in Athens and, and the philosophers, and he could quote the philosophers. He studied all that. Uh, so um, here, when it, let me see, how does it say it? What made me say that? Verse nine. Um, hmm. Forgot why, why I, the point I was getting at, but uh, um, all right. If you didn't know it, uh, <laughs> there's a fact for you. Paul was very scholarly, much more so than any, any other writer of the New Testament that I know, perhaps Luke, he who was a physician, per, perhaps Luke was, was also as learned. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, that's verse 9. Uh, 
Okay, uh, I think it's Renee. It's your turn to read to Ben, isn't it? You still with me? Yeah, I'm not sure Renee commented on that verse. Did you? Uh, yes. Well, I think so. I, I usually wait for both of you to comment, so maybe I went out of turn. But Renee, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, why don't you read verse 10 for Ben? Or or is it Ben's turn to read to you? Do you remember? I don't know. It's her turn to read to me. Okay, go ahead. Read verse 10, and then Ben can uh, teach on it. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but lacked opportunity. Okay. Uh, I had something to say. I'm trying to remember what it was now about this verse. Uh your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. It sounds like it may be related to that financial gift again, um, where perhaps they were able to financially support him once again. Uh, like, for example, they gave him a gift and somehow they, you know, they became poor or something from that gift or, or they couldn't, couldn't contribute much more, but now they have... Uh, to have something again to offer to him um but it says that he they lacked opportunity that to me that that speaks of financial something financial um because spiritual i i think you know they they can always pray for him and, and support him that way uh but uh, I'm, I'm wondering if this is not related to the financial gift that he said previously that only this church supported him uh that they again were flourished in the sense that they were uh flushed with funds again uh that they could uh, provide to him in, in, in the furtherance uh, of the gospel. But uh, I'm sure this verse will become more clear as we read on. But uh, I, I, I'm i not going to say much more until I get more clarity. So that's all I have for that one. Okay, Renee, verse 10. Yeah, I remember they, they weren't able, um, they couldn't, well, then they send you, what was his name, Eusebius, Ben? Eusebius, right? To send. I think so, yes. Yeah, they send some financial gift to him. Uh, they wanted to support him in the past or something, and there was a problem getting it to him. Ah, uh, okay, Remember? yeah. Yeah. That's why I said um, that I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but lacked opportunity. So um, <clears throat> they were unable to get the gift to him before. Uh, and he's saying he realizes it wasn't because they didn't care, or it's just that they couldn't get the gift to him. So he's just acknowledging that. And I believe that this is actual financial help that he's referring to. Okay, um, I wonder if the Amplified will help. It says, I read, <clears throat> uh, by the way, uh, the Amplified, the NABRE, and many other translations, uh, they have titles and subtitles within the chapters that can sometimes be helpful. Um, the title for this chapter uh, in the Amplified is Think of Excellence. And uh, the subtitle, says we're now we're at verse 10 it says god's provisions so it says i rejoiced greatly in the lord that now at last you have renewed your concern for me indeed you were concerned about me before but you had no opportunity to show it so uh, uh I, I i i he must be talking about uh his his and maybe other churches financial needs that he was collecting for other other people had needs other churches had needs and that that's that's what he's talking about them donating uh, paul raising money for others uh and for made his own needs uh that seems to be what is um the subject here um uh, but apparently uh 
they were not able, but you had no opportunity to show it, it says. And in the KJV, it says, uh, but he lacked opportunity. So maybe they, they were in a position where uh, they couldn't help. Uh, not that they didn't want to. I mean, have you ever been in that position? I mean, you know someone needs help, but maybe you need help too, or, or maybe you're just barely getting by and, and there's no way to help. That's, that's worse. It's, it's oh, so much better if you're in a position to help and you don't have to have that uh, conflict uh, going on. Uh, let's see if there's a footnote on it. It says, um, yeah, yeah, there's a footnote on, this is verse 10 to 20. So verses 10 to 20, uh, this footnote applies to that whole portion of scripture. It says, Paul, more directly than anywhere else in the letter here, thanks the Philippians for their gift of money sent through Epaphrodotis, Dodite, Epaphrodotis. Ditus. Um, Paul's own policy was to be self-sufficient as a missionary, supporting himself by his own labor. In spite of this reliance on self and uh, God to provide, Paul accepted gifts from the Philippians not only once, but more than once. Uh, when he was in Thessalonica, uh, as he does now, in prison, um, my uh, while commercial terms appear in the passage like an account of giving and receiving uh, and re received full payment um, paul is most concerned about the spiritual growth of the philippians uh, he emphasizes that god will care for their needs through christ so that's verses 10 through 20 kind of uh, they're they're uh footnotes uh as an overview of the next 10 verses so does that change your uh your thought on the role no i think i think the, the as i suspected the following verses do suggest that it's very financial or it, it, it's very financial oriented uh because he talks about the next verses about uh you know regardless of his circumstances whether he lives in pros material prosperity or or not um it's God who gives them the strength to do so, mm -hmm. to, to, to prosper in either, 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 you know, in, in, in times of, uh, uh, you know, material or prosperity or when he's, when he's like, you know, poor or living humbly, uh, he, yeah. uh, God, God strengthens him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we probably should have read 10 and 11 together. So Ben, why don't you read 11 and let Renee comment on it? I think they're connected though. Okay, verse 11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Yeah, uh, the reason he's mentioning the financial giving of them is not to remind them of his need for it, but to remind them of the blessing of being a giver. Um, he understands that it will bless the church if he receives uh, financial help from them, I believe. Because he says, not that uh, not that I speak in respect of want. So his, his motive for telling them that is not just that he's in need of it. Of course he needs it. He always needs it if he's, he's constantly traveling. Um, not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am, there would to be in content. So whether he's got more than enough or not enough, he's fine. He's, he's going to make it because he knows God is going to supply everything he needs. So um, the reason he's actually bringing it is to remind them of the blessing that they will receive and that they do receive by being a giver. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ben? Uh, bro, I already spoke to, uh, well, well, yeah. So verse 11, yeah, I think it, it, uh, it basically saying exactly what Renee was saying, what we were all saying, that uh, whether, again, whether he's living humbly, you know, on on a day to day with very little food or or material possessions, um, and by material possessions I mean probably think basic stuff like you know a warm cloak or or whatever, um, and, and just food probably, or whether or not he uh, has a uh, you know a, 
he, he did, doesn't have to worry about such things on a day-to-day -day basis. Either way, he knows to be content because God, God has his back. It, it, as you said, Luke, I, I like what you said earlier about God, the God of peace will be with you. He's on your side. He's got your back. He, uh, he knows what you need and he'll make sure that you, you, you he'll make sure that your needs are met. So that's all I have. Hey, it made a point too. I have learned to be content. You were saying that earlier, that this peace that surpasses all understanding, it's not automatic. It comes when you think on these things, when you're uh, prayerful and lean on God. Same thing here. I have learned wherewith to be content. Being content with whatever you have, even in lack, even imprisoned, which he's imprisoned by the Romans right now, he's learned to be content, but he's learned it. He learned it. Yeah, he learned it the hard way through his own experiences. Uh, uh, but um, this reminds me of a conversation I had with my son when he was about 20 years old. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was trying to teach him some fundamental things about how to, uh, you know, be responsible with, with money. And and uh, and he, he's done a really good job of listening to me about these things. Uh, and so I'm very happy that uh, he's uh, done that. But there, at that point, his answer was, well, Dad, isn't experience the best teacher? And I said, well, I know that's what they say, but I say experience is a harsh teacher. That's learning the hard way. Why not learn from other people's experience? Now you're learning from experience, but learning, learning from what other people have already gone through and say, D I've already made those mistakes. You don't need to go through it, learn from what I've done wrong. And so you don't have to make the same mistakes. That That's wisdom. Um, and I think that there are verses in Proverbs that would su support that. Um, a wise man has many counselors, it says. Uh, so, uh, but that's why the reason I'm saying that is because um, Paul is saying he's learned from experience. Well, okay, do we have to go through the same experiences to learn these things, to learn how to be content? Or can we learn from Paul's experience? He's telling us that uh, uh, even, even when you go through all these difficult times, uh, he's learned to be content. Well, okay, maybe we need to start thinking about that now, even before the hard times come. Because guess what? If you live long enough, hard times are going to come one way or another, either in relationships or, or, or financial uh, or health uh, or a number of different ways. So, some kind of problems uh, are going to be really hard uh, to deal with in your life. And, uh, um, it's it's inevitable. It's part. It's just a part of life. As much as breathing, as uh, I say, that life is a series of problems to be solved, and it's like it's like standing on a beach with strong waves, and you're knee deep, and the waves knock you down. And it, when the wave recedes, you stand up and better brace yourself because another wave is coming. And I've learned that that's the case, that, uh, you know, uh, even even when you rebound from one problem, uh, there is another one coming. And so it's a, a you're, we're supposed to learn from all these things. And uh, we're also supposed to be aware that other people are going through the same thing. And uh, when you when you're uh, stable, maybe, OK, instead of just thinking, OK, I'm stable now. Well, maybe someone else is has been knocked down. Maybe it's time for me to to come to their uh, their uh, aid. Uh, I'm going to read it in the uh, Amplified to see how they say it. It says, not that I speak from any personal need, for I have learned to be content, that is, uh, self-sufficient through Christ, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or uneasy, regardless of my circumstances. So, uh, Really, the the the, the uh, book uh, Philippians starts off, and really, I think the theme throughout it is uh, being being able to keep your peace and joy in spite of of, of the problems that you're facing. Uh, but sometimes, maybe it's not peace and joy, but maybe it's contentment. You learn to be content anyway, in, in even though. Um, all right, any any more before we go to verse twelve? 
Um, I think 12 and 13 kind of go together personally, but. Okay. And uh, let me see. Uh, is it your turn to read your Renee? Sure. Why not? Okay, go ahead. Renee verses 12 and 13. He's going to read for you. Okay. Uh, I know both how to be abased and how to be, how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, with, which strengtheneth me. Ah, here it is. I didn't realize it was in this uh, chapter, you guys. We were mentioning earlier how he said, in the peace that passes all understanding, uh, we referred to this. This verse is used by athletes, by uh, people that have great goals in their life. I can do all things and, you know, in a sense, sure, uh, he can give us strength to achieve our worldly goals. But it, nowhere in the scripture is it used for that. Um, I I think this is misused a lot because they don't really like the true meaning of it. Meaning you can do all things. You can endure imprisonment, beating, shipwrecks, losing your home, not have, being poor. They don't like that part, right? That's they, they'll they'll never say I can do all things through Christ. In that, they'll be complaining and screaming and fussing how they feel like God forsook them. Usually, especially the you know prosperity preachers surely would. Uh, and I think it's important to know the context of that verse. He says, "I know both how to be abased and how to abound." So he can be belittled, brought low. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So, uh, everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and hungry, abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So, um, I think it's important here that even in Christ, as a matter of fact, if you're in Christ, those that live godly in Christ will suffer persecution and you can endure that. And sometimes it costs us financially. Uh, it can cost jobs. It can cost division in a family. Uh, Jesus himself said he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword and your position in Christ divides. And uh, I think it's important to know that just because you're brought low or you're suffering need or you don't have all the worldly things you want or desire doesn't mean that God isn't blessing you because that, there's a common teaching and it was common with the Jews too, that if you were rich, it meant God's blessing was on you. You must be a righteous man. That's why the story of Lazarus and the rich man was so shocking to the Jews. A man that wealthy going to hell? I mean, if who could be saved then if rich people can't enter into the kingdom of heaven easily? Remember, he said it's, hard, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. There are rich men. In, really? Like they believed that story that people that were rich must have God's blessing on them. If they were Jews, that is, if they were religious Jews, they must be because they're good people of God. And so uh, this is still taught today that if you, uh, God wants you rich, if you want to be blessed, give to a rich ministry because you know God's blessing is on it. And it's crazy to me. You know, I, I often wonder, do you guys read the, the scriptures? And uh, I think it's important to, to know that, you know, Christians that really speak up about their faith, live for the Lord, stand their ground for what is true and right, they will suffer some sort of persecution. It doesn't say you might. It says you will. That's important to remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Brother Ben. Yeah, I agree, Renee, hundred percent. The, the all things are basically referring to his, his circumstances, uh, whether they're, you know, their circumstances are in prison, 
and in need of food and material, basic material things, or he has a, abundance in material, his material needs are fully met, his his circumstances were essentially irrelevant. Uh, what was it? What was what was relevant was his relationship to Christ and his knowing that God uh, was with him in the in his ministry of the gospel. So the all things again, like you already said, it's not like oh well, God God's gonna help me uh, get this career or whatever. Uh, it, it's possible uh, if it's for if it's for your good and or, or for His glory, but. Um, I, ultimately, that's not what it means. It's referring to, like Renee said, through, through thick, through the good and the bad, it, he could do all things. God strengthens him, um, and again, I think it's mostly in relationship to the fellowship of the gospel or the ministration of the gospel, um, which he was. Uh, he, he, you know, again, he was sent to the Gentiles. So um, I, I agree. This verse is often abused and misused, and I think the context makes it very clear. It's all about. Uh, like you said in verse in verse eleven, that whatever state I'm in, to be content. Uh, he wasn't, you know, he, he didn't, he wasn't, uh, like you said, Renee, he wasn't uh, considering himself forsaken by God if he, if he was in in need of material things, um, and nor was he boastful if he if he was uh, if if he was supported by uh, fellow believers financially um, through material wealth. Not and material wealth was just again. A, a, a means to an end, which is getting the gospel out. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that before, but uh, I know that there are a lot of times in athletics, um, uh, people will quote that verse. I, I remember two people in the uh, the UFC I've watched. Uh, they've had that tattooed on them, or they'll be interviewed and they'll they'll say that. And I'm always happy to hear them quote scripture and identify with, with Christ. But uh, really, I, as I'm looking at the verse now, listening, it's uh, I don't think it's really to um, make us a, achieve. It's, a, it's, it's there to help us to endure things, not to achieve things. Um, let me read it in the um, Amplified and see how it's stated here. Uh, uh, we, we did, did we read 12 and 13 together? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, I know how to get along and live humbly in difficult times. And I also know how to enjoy abundance and live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing life, whether well-fed or going hungry, whether having an abundance or being in need. I can do all things which he has called me to do through him. By the way, when it says which he has called me to do, that's a, a parentheses. Uh, obviously, this is a, 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 an addition or an amplification to, that they want us to, uh, they're, they're expounding on it as we are uh, saying it. Like when it says I can do all things, they're saying, all the things which he's called me to do is what if we have to keep that in mind. It's not necessarily you can do all things like, OK, uh, um, I, I, I need to have millions of dollars. That's what my goal is. Well, that's not maybe what God's called you to do. God's not interested in you becoming super wealthy, uh, but uh, he's calling you to do something else. Those things, you're going to have Christ strengthening you. But to. If your goal is not in line with with your, what God's called you to do, then don't count on this. Don't count on the help from uh, which, all which He has called me to do through Him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill His purpose. I am self sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through Him who infuses me. And with inner strength and confident peace. So um, I think they did a pretty good job, made it some, some good key points there. I always think back on this time uh, such a long time ago. Uh, when I first started doing Bible studies with people and uh, hosting them, uh, I, I did a Bible study just like we're doing it right now, except it was in my home with a, a few people. Uh, and... Uh, somebody brought a friend along 
And, and this, this is a young man that was very enthusiastic and very positive. And, but uh, he was trying to make the point to all of us that um, uh, the, the verse he wanted to, uh, you know, for us to focus on is that uh, um, I came to give you life and give it more abundantly. So he was from that school of thought where, you know, uh, the prosperity gospel. Uh, and my answer to him was, well, um, that's, uh, the, that's in the Bible. But explain to me then uh, how, uh, how Paul's abundant life. Paul had an abundance of, of um, being beaten with cane, uh, being, being whipped 39 lashes, being shipwrecked, stoned, uh, uh, imprisoned, and finally martyred. That, that's, that's the abundance that he had in his life. So um, I, to think that, that God's going to give you an abundance of blessings all the, all the time and that God is somehow, you know, he's, he's, he's duty bound to, to answer your prayers for prosperity. Uh, and now God's you're there to serve you by you, whatever you pray for, you, you should be able to get it if you believe it enough. Um, he didn't have an answer, but I don't think he changed his mind. Um, uh, all right, any, any more on those verses? I mean, really, this is one of the most quoted verses, I think, especially from the people who maybe their perspective is is not the way that we uh, we're, we're teaching right now. That, yeah, yeah really you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, if, if in terms of enduring hardship, but not to you know become champions and 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 exactly. begin the greatest wealth. You know, one of my the the captain of the cheerleading squad in my high school had that for her slogan for her senior year, and I still remember it to this day. Going, that's not what that means. I remember it because it was like, hey, I'm the captain. Of the I'm with the football player. I'm doing great. I make straight A's. I'm this. I can do all things. It was, you know, all my achievements. And con and it's very sweet that she gave God credit for her success. But I will never forget that that was the context. And I still hear it for people that have worldly goals they want to achieve. And I, you could certainly say that, but I would, I would be wary of that because a lot of times our worldly goals are about our ego and our desires and what we can do to elevate ourselves and has nothing to do with our walk with the lord yeah and also luke i thought was uh really great what you said is that it wasn't strengthened to achieve but strengthened to to endure but uh but I, I'd even actually th thought about a little bit more, and I would even take it a little bit further than that. And um, and also, too, like you said, about calling. It, it's, it's strengthening to to um, to fulfill the calling. And I think that ties us back to uh, verse 14 in the previous chapter where he says, I pressed toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Um and so rather than strengthen to even endure, although that's certainly true, I would almost take it a step further and say it's strengthened to, to fulfill. Uh, like as, as, for example, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should, not must, but should walk in them. And so in that sense, I think he does strengthen us to uh, fulfill the works that he has uh, prepared for us beforehand um, to walk in to walk in them. Um, and so I thought that was a really great distinction. I think you summed it up really well. And uh, I think that's, that's huge. Guess we'll be doing another video on this verse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Renee, I'll tell you, um, somebody else, I can't remember who said it, but somebody else recently told me how much they look forward to your um, follow-up videos. Oh yeah. Cause you guys always make me think of something when we do the Bible. School. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but I, I think on that verse uh, 13, uh, I'm glad that I think I finally get it now because I, I, I've always loved the verse, but I never really saw the full the full context of it before. So I'm happy about that. Yeah, uh, awesome. I think that uh, 
Well, let me try to read a group of verses because uh, we, so we can try to fin finish up this chapter and this book tonight. Okay. And uh, uh, some of these verses here, we can lump together here. Uh, so let me read a few. And uh, it, verse 14, it says, um, Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now, ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound your account. Uh, but I have all and abound. I am full having received Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So through 18, 14 through 18, uh, I think, Ben, it's your turn to go first. Okay, well, uh, this kind of, uh, kind of, uh, well, a couple things. Where it says, uh, now you Philippians know, um, no church shared with me concerning the giving and receiving, but you only. And we, I, I suggested it in chapter one where I thought the verse is often misused where people say that uh, what the, the good work that God's begun in you, he is faithful to, I forget the exact wording, paraphrasing, he is faithful to bring it to fruition, essentially. Uh, and people tie that to salvation, that the good work of salvation, so that, in other words, if you are a real believer, then you God has started that good work in you and you will persevere to the end in, in faith and in good works and if if you fall away then that's just proof that that work wasn't started by God it was uh it was um it was done in your flesh <laughs> and again I, I reject that wholeheartedly um and I, I and so I, I, I I'm convinced uh, I'm fully convinced that that what he's referring to that good work is this financial gift. And what's interesting, I, as you read it there just a minute ago, where he said, um, I hate to find the exact verse, but he says something about uh, having a, having it done it again. Uh, you said the word again. Let me take a look here. I'm sorry. One second. Um, okay. Uh, it, it, well, anyways, you said the word again, and I think it, it was about them giving the gift again. I don't think it was 17 once or 18. And once and again. Yeah, once and again. I think that's in, that's in a parallel to verse 10 where he said, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly now that now at last your care for me has flourished again. So I think it very much it is, I think it's pretty definitive now that it, it is referring to that financial gift that they gave him a financial gift and that for whatever reason they lacked the opportunity to give him more financial financially again whether it was because of geography or logistics or didn't have the funds at the time whatever it may be uh they were able to fulfill it again and i'm again confident this is tying it back to the opening chapter where he talks about this is the good work this financial this financial uh uh fellowship if you will in the gospel is what he's referring to this is the only church that supported him and he was confident that that this financial gift that they're supporting him God was going to use it beyond just the scope of this church. Um, and he was going to use it for the furtherance of the gospel to other churches and, and, uh, and other believers. So it has nothing to do with personal salvation, but all having to do completely with the furtherance of the gospel. And um, I think that's exactly what these verses are referring to. Oh, with regards to the sweet smell, smell, smelling aroma, acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God, well, I, again, I think uh, you know there's other verses that say that we should uh, we should live our lives, and again, in keeping with the idea of conducting ourselves and following Paul's example, um, that we should uh, our reasonable sacrifice is to live a life that's um, that's again the one that denies our our fleshly lusts and uh, is seeking to serve God and and uh, fellow believers and the furtherance of the gospel essentially. So. That'd be my quick recap on those verses. Okay, Sister Renee, 14 through 18. Yep, and I would agree with that. This is the financial thing as as uh, far as what he's saying, like 
uh, hold on. Notwithstanding you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Um, and yeah, he starts, it is the financial gift. Uh, tells them all the times that they'd helped or desired to help. But when it says, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. Now that might be strange to the modern mind. That's something that a, a, a good work being done or money be, would be a sweet smell to someone. But in the old covenant, even pagans knew they offered burnt sacrifices. And it was understood that it was, uh, they like when they offered food or, or animals, they knew that, that their gods couldn't eat the food, but the, the smell pleased them. Right. That's why you'd see on um, the Temple of Jupiter, they would sprinkle perfume and stuff like that. So it se sounds weird to us. But if you like, for instance, you can, you can pick anywhere in the Old Testament. But in Genesis, when Noah uh, gets off the ark, uh, he says he, he all, builds an altar unto the Lord, took of every clean beast and of every fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And then you hear this language. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's uh, sake. So you see in several places where a burnt sacrifice was a sweet smelling savor. And as Ben said, what is an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord now is presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. That is a sweet smelling savor to God. So good works are a sweet smelling savor. Uh, a heart towards God, a love for his commandments, uh, all of these things, a love for Jesus. Uh, all of these things are a sacrifice to God that's considered a sweet smelling savor. And that all comes from the language of sacrifices done in the old covenant. So if that is unfamiliar language to you, you can research some of uh, how these gifts were offered to God. Uh, there were wave offerings and and sin offerings and all kinds of things, free will gift offerings. And uh, they certainly would have understood what that meant. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, the, the, a lot of the verses as you finish out each of these books are just uh, uh, salutations and, and stuff. So it, that's why we can. Um, finish up here, even though there seem to be a lot of verses left. Uh, I'm going to read 14 through 18 and amplify just to see if it uh, has any way of stating it that could help us. Um, Nevertheless, it was right of you to share with me in my difficulties. And you Philippians know that in the early days of preaching the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Uh, not that I seek the gift itself, but I do seek the profit which increases to your heavenly account, the blessings which is accumulating for you. But I have received everything in full and more. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent me, they are the fragrant aroma of an offering, an acceptable sacrifice which God welcomes and in which he delights. Um, I think that uh, they expressed it in a way that it's easy for us to understand what was going on here, but I, I, I really thought that the way they expressed the, uh, uh, says, but I do seek the profit which increases to your heavenly account the blessing which is accumulating for you. So he is acknowledging and reminding them that, hey, you are building up treasures in heaven. And that, uh, again, uh, you may encounter some teachers here. Uh, as there are some you know, real gospel teachers, but they just see that uh, the reward system uh, differently than, than we do. I think all of us here agree that uh, um, there's nothing wrong with... Uh, 
understanding and even being motivated by the fact that God promises rewards. Jesus said, uh, don't build up treasures on earth, but build up treasures in heaven. And, and Paul, Paul talks about the Bema seat where we're going to have gold, silver, precious gems, and, and, and uh, precious gems, and and five different crowns that we can actually earn. There is a merit system. We we're not on the merit system to, for salvation. That's a free gift, but we are on a merit system for these treasures and rewards. And so there, uh, Paul is reminding them that you're giving. Uh, you're going to be rewarded for it. There's going to be treasures in heaven for you. Uh, there's a footnote here for verse um, uh, 15 and 18. It says um, 15 is the beginning of the gospel. Uh, it was at Philippi that Paul first preached Christ in Europe, going on from there to Thessalonica and Berea. And, and uh, verse 18, the aroma and the sacrifice, that's an Old Testament cultic language applied to the Philippians gift. Yeah, I don't know why it says cultic uh, language. Uh, well, it's Old Testament language, but why would they say it's cultic language? I, <laughs> I don't get that. Uh, all right. Uh, any more on that before we, we continue on? Okay, let's look at 19. Um, let me read uh, 19 and, uh, and 20. Uh, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, wh whose turn is to go first? I think it's mine. Is it mine? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Luke. Uh, yeah, I, I hear this one twisted by prosperity preachers too. Um, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by uh, Christ Jesus. Uh, I, I believe, yes, he's referring to financial here um, and also all the spiritual things they will need, like the things he brought up, uh, patience, peace, all of these things. Uh, and it sounds like the riches there is actually not financial riches to them, but riches for them to give outward. Like it is a uh, it's like a twisting of what Paul's saying it, it, in the worldview, you, you'd be wealthy uh, uh, by receiving. Right. But in God's kingdom, you're wealthy by giving. And so I think when he says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, I, I believe that also refers to their ability to continue to give uh not that because he said not that i desire a gift but i desire fruit that may abound to your account so i believe that this is a spiritual blessing as well as financial um because i, I don't think it's ever just one thing and and because the the point of financial is to abound spiritually so that the gospel can go out to others. That's the point of it. God doesn't give people riches just for riches sake. He, he, he gives people financial worldly gifts so that they, because they can be trusted to support gospel ministries, uh, support the message of the gospel getting out to do the good works that would glorify his name. That's the purpose of anybody in the church having any financial wealth, it would be always to promote his kingdom, never for their own personal uh, ease from what I can see in scripture. Because it even says in other places that the poor should work and stop stealing, that thieves should stop stealing, get a job, not so that they can have money, but that they can help the poor. Like, that's the whole point. They can take care of themselves and what's not needed, they can give it out to others. 
that are needed in the church. Okay. All right, Ben. I 100% agree with Renee. I think that 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 concept that she was talking about uh, is in one of Paul's pastoral epistles. I think it's what, Timothy, I think. Uh, but yes, the, uh, it, it's a blessing to have something to give to others. And it says here, where it says, according to his riches in, in glory, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Well, God's glory in Christ Jesus was really his sacrifice and his grace. And so uh, by giving, you know, our gift, uh, by giving, sacrificing you, if you will, a gift that we have, instead of using it for ourselves, but to give it to, get to someone else, that's grace. Um, it's kind of, it's, sacri it's, it's being sacrificial. Um, it's a self-sacrifice, so to speak. And we're giving it through someone else through grace. And that's, again, that's in keeping with God's glory. That's that, that's what God does. Um, you know, we sacrifice for the benefit of others. That's what we should do. We should, uh, Lisa says it all the time. Uh, we're, you know, we're meant to be a blessing to others. And um, I think that's exactly what Paul's saying here. It, 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 you know, it, it's, uh, I think, again, like, like Renee said, it's, it's, it should be a... We should consider it a blessing that we have something to give to others or have something to to, to serve God with. God, God's amazing. He, he provides uh, everything we need to even worship him properly. Yeah, amen. Um, well, the, the idea of giving and helping others, uh, I think we should all remember that uh, uh, we can not only give help financially but sometimes the help they really really need is not even financial it's uh, some other kind of help uh, we have a lot of people that are, are contributing to the ces and in, in, in not financially but but in other ways so that so that uh, this uh, church uh, programs uh, can happen, and, and that's another way of giving, uh, giving of your time, giving of your talents. Uh, let me read uh, those verses in the uh, Amplified, 1920. And my God will liberally supply, uh, fill until full your every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, I don't really want to have anything to add from what you both said. So let's, let me read those last three verses together here, uh, which is the, just, just closing remarks. Get your thoughts on that. And at the same time, give, a, give us your, your kind of summary on the book, uh, since this we're finishing up the entire book of Philippians. So uh, 21 through 23 is... Uh, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Uh, I forgot, uh, is it Renee's turn to go first? I think. It's Ben's. Okay, Ben. Okay, uh, so I'm going to come in on these verses and then also give my summary. Um, not a, a ton to say here. Uh, he says, all the saints salute you chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. They that are of Caesar's household, I believe is just another way of saying those who are uh, in the employment of Rome, possibly even soldiers. I'm not sure what you guys think about that, but that's my understanding. Um all the saints salute you chiefly that they, they that are of Caesar's household. It's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a common closing out the letter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. For, with you all. Amen. This is uh, pretty typical of Paul's uh, closing sentiments. Um, so not, not a ton of comment there. Uh, so Philippians, I thought this was a, a, a an interesting. I think we did a good job of untangling some verses that are often tangled. I think we came to some good sound conclusions. Um, and I I've never spent a, a ton of time reading Philippians 
uh, studying Philippians. This is the first real study I've ever done of it. Um, and so I learned a lot. Um, it was not, you know, it was mostly, again, some themes that I thought I, I saw were about gaining and losing. Again, gaining and losing in that, you know, in God's economy, uh, losing um, material uh, things uh, or earthly things, even the law, the, the law is referred to as uh, weak and beggarly things uh, by Paul in, Gal in um, Galatians, for example. So earthly things or, or worldly things or material things, um, losing those uh, for the gain of spiritual things, uh, that's God's economy, whereas uh, the world will tell you just the opposite. They t they'll tell you, you know, forsake the spiritual things that are, those are things that you can't be sure of. They, you know, that's just, that's what are just fables and stories. Uh, that's never really going to happen. Uh, you know, Christ would have come, come by now, don't you know, the Bible's, uh, not true. Um, and, 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 and again, God's economy is just the opposite. Uh, we are spo not supposed to love anything in this world, uh, but really be focused on, on, on the eternal. Uh, and I saw that, that theme played out over and over again. And the foolish are the ones, the false teachers, the foolish, the, the, the Judaizers or unbelievers. Again, they, they, they only, they, they walk by sight and they, they are focused on the material things and what, how, what they can accomplish in this life for this life, not what they can invest into an eternity. And so I, I love how Paul, uh, really, you know, re rebukes that and, and, uh, condemns it and shows the folly of it. Um. And so I thought that this was a really interesting epistle for that reason. Um, and I'm sure it'll, it'll uh, pay dividends in the future in, in, in interpretive, for interpreting other passages as well in the future. Um, we're on Colossians next, which is also very interesting. I love that. that uh, a lot of great verses in that uh, epistle, uh, but also one that I have not really studied end-to-end -end carefully. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Amen. All right. Thank you. All right, Renee. You know, saying chiefly those of Caesar's household is a big deal because Nero was one of the most wicked, wretched people and enemies of Christians. He burned them alive to light his garden at night. And he would burn several of them lined up during parties, screaming. Uh, lit him as torches. And so for him to say chiefly of Caesar's household means that these people were probably scared to death of this man and the might of Rome. And the fact that they could see that even those that witnessed firsthand the evil he did to God's people, they still converted to Christianity. That was power of the Holy Spirit working where Paul was. He's in captivity. And if they ever question why Paul didn't just leave instead of demanding to be seen by Caesar, well, God sent him there. He told him to go there so that he could get a trip to Rome and convert the Romans and save souls along the way. So that surely put at ease the hearts of those that live in constant fear of the shadow of Rome. That God is working miracles, even saving those of Caesar's own household that saw firsthand constant tortures that he did to them. That regardless of knowing what he did to Christians and would do to them, they still con converted to, G to faith in Jesus. That's, that's got to be very uplifting to these people in Philippi. You know, it really, really confirms the power of the Holy Spirit working in Paul. So I, I think that would be something that would just really blow the minds of them. And yeah, Philippians is not a book that I have. It's not one of my go to books like Galatians is one. Romans is one, you know, but I, I love it because I find little nuggets uh, we know this was a, a famous verse that she used and, um, it's been really interesting, you know, knowing what was going on, uh, during this letter, you know, Paul was imprisoned by Rome at the moment and 
all that went on. And it just takes you back to that time. And it's, you see through a different lens. So, and, and like Colossians coming up, I've read them all, but I don't, I don't have a ton of verses from memory there. They're not my go-to books. So I'm looking forward to studying them as well. This is a lot of practical advice uh, to the churches. His epistles are fantastic. It, he, he, always, he, he always follows uh, edifying them, confirming the hope they have set before them, confirming the promises, uh, minimizing what they have to endure. Look, it's just for a little while. God's with you. Don't, you know, don't lose hope. Don't lose faith. You're, you're not in this alone, etc. And then he gives them practical ways uh, to have unity and to walk as Christians should walk, uh, worthy of our vocation, uh, etc. So I, I love that all his letters, um, promote and confirm the hope we have in Jesus. So I really enjoyed the study. It's a short one though. Yeah. Amen. Oh uh, yeah. There's a lot in these four chapters. Uh, uh, by the way, I, the, uh, there's a footnote on Caesar's household. It says uh, minor officials or even slaves and freedmen found in Ephesus or Rome, among other places. Uh, so these are minor officials of in the in Caesar's government, I guess, uh, or slaves that work within uh, Caesar's uh, house. Wow, how'd you like to be a Christian slave in Caesar's house? And uh, yeah, Nero was horrible. Uh, Diocletian was uh, the next really, really bad one. Uh, but for a couple of centuries, you, you had uh, uh, a lot of martyrs. I mean, talk about uh, s s suffering. Uh, there's one thing uh, to have, uh, uh, let's say, um, giving your body as, a, I mean, you're offering your body as a living sacrifice. But there comes a point where now you're offering your body as a dying sacrifice. And that's the choice that is coming to much of the church as history moves, moves forward uh, after the apostles. Uh, they're all basically given this choice to you, uh, you either renounce Jesus and, uh, and uh, worship Caesar. Uh, 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 there's this saying as a... Um, uh, um, Caesar Corios, that means Caesar's Lord. You have to say Caesar's Lord, rather. And but the, the, then the believers in the predicament, they if they say Caesar's Lord, and they're free to go. If they, but if they don't say Caesar's Lord, and they say Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, uh, then uh, they're going to be. Um, killed so three three things happened some people are not willing to die and they're they're called lapsers their their confession lapsed and that dealing with the lapsers later when they wanted to come back years later maybe was a big uh, controversy in there, how to deal with the lapsers uh, but then the, the then there's another people who they're the confessors and the martyrs the con the, if you confess, no, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar's Lord, uh, then you, the, you'll probably be martyred and killed. But some of the confessors were not martyrs. And so they were just called confessors. They were willing to confess Jesus and willing to die, but somehow they were spared. Um, uh, uh, or they, they, uh, they confess Jesus and they end up confessing him and resulting in their death and they become martyrs many of the people were eager to become martyrs it was and their ambition to be a martyr but that's uh, that's what happened and so being living in caesar's house as a believer especially if it was nero uh you're going to be uh put on a pole and lit on fire as renee said and used as a light like a candle to to light up the area yeah, I think he even mocked him and says, you're the light of the world. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, who, yeah. wow, I've never heard that, but. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, what's that? 
It makes me sick to my stomach. Yeah, I know. I, I heard that. That's, I think that's very factually, uh, historically true. He used to say, oh, you want to be the light of the world, huh? Uh, let's, ho put, let's hoist you up here and set you ablaze. Uh, so the book was uh, was great. Uh, I, it's four chapters, so not long, but a lot of great information. We started off by saying it's a book to talk about how uh, to keep your joy in spite of the circumstances. And that was really the, the main message throughout. So it's really a, a great book of encouragement. Uh, there, there are also some very profound verses, a handful of you know famous verses that are cited quite quite a lot. Uh, as far as um, uh, Colossians, uh, there's basically two two things going on in Colossians. Uh, one is the dealing with the Gnostics that are challenging uh, the the deity of Christ, uh, and then the uh, the other part is uh, to uh, get the people to uh, let's say uh, live the Christian life. It's uh, um, set your mind on things above. Uh, so those are the two main points that we'll uh, we'll learn about uh, in uh, Colossians going forward. So join us next week for that. Uh, how was the chat room tonight? I didn't get to look at it very much, but uh, uh, any, Brene or Ben, do you know anything about the comments on that? Well, uh, I mean, the chat room was great. Everybody was pretty much on topic. It was there was no uh, divisions, but a certain person couldn't stay out. Came in under a different name several times, but yeah, it's it's a marked uh, difference. Uh, very pleasant. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good. I think one person got upset. And by the way, if you're timed out for like 300 seconds, it's not personal. Don't get mad and storm off. This is the last time I'm here. Something happened. Either you went off topic and the chat room is just following the rules, trying to keep everybody geared in. And they probably told you, hey, don't call people names or don't make fun of so and so. They've said it a couple of times to keep doing it. Or if you've gone off topic and you keep going after they've asked you a couple of times, it's just a time to go out. And then you come back and it's no big deal. I mean, we all mess up and break rules sometimes. They're just doing their job. It's not to personally assault you. So, um, and if we've asked you to stay away for a while, there's a reason for that. And we just ask that you respect that. And we do everything we can to make everybody feel welcome. And we don't, we don't want to support talking ugly about others, even if they're false teachers. Even if they're false teachers, we, we you know, I'm guilty of that because I got a bad mouth. And sometimes I make nicknames up for false teachers. I shouldn't do that, but I have. And so, uh, it's true. We should we should always have uh, an air of kindness about us um, because we are being watched. So if that happens, please don't take it personal or or, you know, think we hate you or you're not welcome here. It's just we put very strict rules up for the chat moderators and they're just trying to keep their um, their position uh, as per the chat room rules. OK. Um. Hmm. Well, let me see. This is uh, Wednesday, so uh, Renee, you still have a, you have a, something planned, but not this Thursday. When's when's your, your next uh, Thursday throwdown? Tomorrow. Oh, it, you're, it is tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow oh. we have the author Gary Wayne coming back to talk about secret societies. Uh, Illuminati, the divine right of kings that goes all the way back to Genesis 6 conspiracy. So he's going to be talking specifically about secret societies uh, and elite bloodlines and their plans. That's oh, what we're doing. Great. I know Nine o'clock tomorrow on my channel, Renee yeah. Rollin channel, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, it's, it's been a while since you had a Thursday throwdown, so I know everybody's real eager for that to happen again. So uh, I'll look forward to that. Uh, and then Friday night, join us again here on the CES channel, uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern time for fun fellowship Friday night. And uh, we will be having uh, Brother Jordan on the panel. Uh, so uh, it'll be his first time participating on the panel. So and I think he will use his camera. Very few people uh, use their cameras uh, on the panel. Uh, 
Um, you're probably getting tired of seeing my face. We always love to see Renee's face, but uh, I think that uh, Jordan uses a camera, so you'll get to see and hear Jordan uh, Friday night. All right, uh, thank you everybody for participating and uh, look forward to being with you all next time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.